Hello, YouTubers and NFL fans everywhere. This is Matt, the NFL fanatic, giving you my Week 7, 2023 NFL predictions. Well, for the fanatic this week, it was a good week overall. I at least went 500 or better in both my against the spread and straight up predictions. Uh, so I will take that. Though uh, definitely with how the week um, was expected to go, it definitely on the spread perspective, it definitely did not go the way I thought it would. Especially in the sense of the Niners and Browns and the Eagles and Jets. I definitely thought at the time when I did my video that I had good feelings about a three-point spread for the Niners and a six-and-a-half point spread for Philadelphia. Boy, was I wrong about that. And uh, so that was that was tough to see. And then a couple of the upsets I had, I was only able to hit one of them. Uh, New Orleans ended up losing by seven off a cruddy sequence by Derek Carr and the Saints. And it just objectively where, you know, but getting the 500 due to the late game and prime time window, I will gladly take that and celebrate that. Because I ended up going, uh, I believe, four and one, or yeah, four, four and one in the prime, uh, late prime time window, to get me to five hundred. So I will gladly take that. And once again, for everybody tonight, I have Dallas minus two and a half uh, tonight in Los Angeles. So just take quick thoughts on that. But let me go through my against spread straight up records from last week. So against the spread, I went seven and seven, five hundred. So I will take that. Still above five hundred for the year. So through going on to the halfway point of the season, I will gladly take that. Uh, and those straight up as well. I went 10 and 4 straight up. That equals 71.4%. Uh, and so that is a fantastic week and a 15-game week to get double-digit victories. That is great. Uh, the only four losses I had were Niners-Eagles, which, again, straight up nobody really expected. And the one game that I should have picked, Vikings-Bears. I knew the Vikings had a better quarterback. I just thought the offense of Justin Jefferson would not be able to uh, do a lot. Fortunately, the offense didn't, but Justin Fields and uh, Baggett, or Baggett, um, I, forget, I, I forget his first name, but the back quarterback for the Bears could not do anything offensively, and they also had a pick, they also had a fumble return touchdown, which basically was the difference in the game. So going ten and four with those uh, situations, Houston New Orleans is a one score game. I will take that uh, straight up perfectly. But now overall for the year against the spread, I am now forty six and forty four and two which equals 51%, and straight up now I am 58 and 34, which equals 63%. So I am happy with my against the spread record. This is the longest it's probably gone, where it's still above 500 overall. This week I feel pretty good about the spots I'm in, because I feel like the games are pretty much mostly in reasonable numbers. Uh, so hopefully I can improve that against the spread record up by having a great week on the spread this week. Uh, straight up though, again, Another 10 win week, six more games above 500. Keep that number going up, and I definitely could hit I average 65%. It's looking like that as this year goes on. So those are my records there. But what a, what a wild week in the league, though. You you had the two undefeated teams in the NFC, the Niners and the Eagles, both go down in brutal fashions. And I would love, and I've heard all this all day. And I would love to hear from any of my viewers out there. Which loss do you think was worse? The Niners lost to the Browns, losing to the third-string quarterback, Philip, Jean, uh, Philip James Walker. Or the Eagles losing without their top three corners in the game, along with a myriad of offensive line injuries and Garrett Wilson being out for the rest of that game at the end as well. I'd love your opinion for any viewer out there. Niners or Eagles, which loss do you think was worse for the year? And then a lot of the other common things happened. Jacksonville played a very effective and consistent game against the Indianapolis Colts. Eight straight wins for the Jags. In Jacksonville, over uh, Indianapolis, incredibly impressive. They also swept the season series uh, for the first time in a while, which I uh, was very impressed with that. I think it was 2017 was the last time they swept the season series uh, this early. I thought Jack Washington Atlanta was a weird game of where Atlanta thoroughly dominated on the offensive and defensive side of the ball, but the biggest difference was Desmond Ritter had three massive turnovers, and the Commanders did not, and also they had a huge punt uh, punt return which basically was the difference in the game of getting into a leading position. So, but, you know, hey, Commanders and Falcons, both 3-3, three and three, 
Both kind of teams where I think they're basically mirror images of each other. Young quarterbacks in their 22 class that have some potential, but have had turnover issues. And I think both the teams, where is thankfully they're in the NFC, they could be competitive and a feisty out for some people. I think both those teams are not playoff teams uh, the way they are projected to go the rest of the year from their uh, play style and skill. I'm trying to think of a few of the other quick headlines from the games that I can highlight here. Patriots Raiders, that was an ugly, weird offensive game where the Raiders could not, after that one touchdown to Jacoby Myers, you know, former Patriot on Patriot crime there. After that, they both the Raiders could not get in the end zone. They've had massive red zone problems a majority of the year. And then the Patriots, they were able to finally score after about thir uh, 13 quarters, the longest streak since 1991 that they went that long about scoring a touchdown. But unfortunately, due to some Bad drop, especially one by Devontae Parker. The Patriots lose again, making Josh McDaniels 3-0 all-time against his former coach, two times in Las Vegas, one time in Denver, Week 5, 2009. And I honestly don't, you know, the pick six, it's honestly more pathetic that Mac Jones got sacked in the end zone in the game instead of, you know, trying to get the ball out of there instead of punting. And it gets worse than the actual attempt to tackle we had on Chandler Jones. So, uh, But to me, though, hey, I will take the safety because that helped get the three-point cover. So. <laughs> so thank you, Max Crosby, who's been their best overall player uh, outside of Devontae Adams for helping with that cover. Uh, and then Seattle-Cincinnati. One quick thing about that. I'm telling people, Geno turned back into a pumpkin. Geno Smith did not play well. I was not impressed. He had two horrible interceptions that kept the Bengals in the game. Out of the Bengals today, had a pretty good first, first half. They got that one rookie who called his first touchdown. That was very nice Joe to get him the ball back. But the second half, ladies and gentlemen, that Seahawks defense played a tremendous game. They held the Seattle Seahawks, uh, the Cincinnati Bengals offense, to 58 total yards the rest of the way through. So I was incredibly impressed by that. And, uh, yeah, so those are my quick thoughts on the games, and I'll probably explain some more thoughts as I go through my uh, picks this week. Before I get to those, though, it is one of the big 16 bye week, six teams, not 16, 16 bye weeks, where you have the Carolina Panthers, the Cincinnati Bengals, the Dallas Cowboys, the Houston Texans, the New York Jets, and the Tennessee Titans all on by this week. So if you have Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, Joe Mixon, the Panthers defense, Chubba Hubbard, Bryce Young, Adam Thielen, C.J. Stroud, the Texans defense, Heidi Fairbairn, Dalton Schultz, Nico Collins, the Jets defense, Brees Hall, Garrett Wilson, Derek Henry, Ryan Tannehill, the Titans defense, Nick Folk. If you have any of those players on your fantasy teams, Bench them because they will not be playing this week. It is a very short and narrow 13-game window this week. So hopefully this video goes a little bit, goes a little quicker than the other ones do just because of the lack of games that will be played this weekend. So just wanted to give a quick shout-out there. All right, it's time for my uh, picks for this week. So this Thursday, when the 4-2 and two Jacksonville, Jaguars, Jacksonville Jaguars travel to New Orleans to take on the 3-3 three and three New Orleans Saints, the... New Orleans Saints are one-point favorites in this game. Uh, I am going to take Jacksonville here plus one in a very mild upset, and I, essentially a pick them. I'm going to take Jacksonville here plus one and Jacksonville straight up. Then the next game, when the 3-3 three and three Las Vegas Raiders travel to Chicago, take on the 1-5 Chicago Bears, the Las Vegas Raiders are three-point favorites in this game, giving the Las Vegas Raiders here minus three and the Las Vegas Raiders straight up. Then the next game, when the 3-2 and two Cleveland Browns travel to Indianapolis, take on the 3-3 three and three Indianapolis Colts. The Cleveland Browns are two-point favorites in this game. Give me Cleveland here, minus two, and Cleveland straight up. Then the next game, when the 4-2 and two Buffalo Bills travel to New England, to take on the 1-5 and five New England Patriots. The Buffalo Bills are nine-and-a-half-point favorites in this game. Give me the Buffalo Bills here to win straight up, but I'm going to take New England plus nine-and-a-half. Then the next game, when the... 3-3 three three Washington Commanders travel to New York to take on the 1-5 New York Giants. The Washington Commanders are two-point favorites in this game. Give me Washington here, minus two, and Washington straight up. Then the next game, when the 3-3 three three Atlanta Falcons travel to Tampa Bay to take on the 3-2 Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers are two-and-a-half-point favorites in this game. Give me the Tampa Bay Buccaneers here, minus two-and-a-half, and Tampa Bay straight up. Then the next game, when the 5-1 Detroit Lions travel to Baltimore to take on the 4-2 Baltimore Ravens. The Baltimore Ravens are three-point favorites in this game. In my biggest upset of the week, 
I am actually going to take Detroit here, plus three, and Detroit straight up. And then the next game, when the three and two Pittsburgh Steelers travel to Los Angeles to take on the three and three Los Angeles Rams. Los Angeles Rams are three point favorites in this game, giving the Los Angeles Rams here minus three, and the Los Angeles Rams straight up. Then the next game, when the one and five Arizona Cardinals travel to Seattle to take on the three and two Seattle Seahawks. The Seattle Seahawks are eight point favorites in this game. Give me Seattle here, minus eight, and Seattle straight up. Then the next game, when the three, when the two and three Green Bay Packers travel to Denver to take on the one and five Denver Broncos. The Denver Broncos are one and a half point underdogs in this game. Give me then in a kind of surprising turn of events, especially for Denver being at home. Give me the Green Bay Packers here, minus one and a half, and the Green Bay Packers straight up. Then the next game, when the 3-2 and two or 2-3 two and three Los Angeles Chargers travel to Kansas City to take on the 5-1 and one Kansas City Chiefs. The Kansas City Chiefs are 5.5 point favorites in this game. Give me the Kansas City Chiefs here straight up, but I'm going to take the Los Angeles Chargers plus 5.5. Then the next game, when the 5-1 and one Miami Dolphins travel to Philadelphia to take on the 5-1 Philadelphia Eagles in the Alabama Battle Part 2, Jalen vs. Tua. The Philadelphia Eagles are two-point favorites in this game in a slight upset for my third outright underdog here. I am going to take Miami here plus two and Miami straight up to pull up their upset outright and beat the Philadelphia Eagles, sending them to their second straight loss. And finally, in the Monday night game, when the 5-1 San Francisco 49ers travel to Minnesota, take on the 2-4 and four Minnesota Vikings. The San Francisco 49ers are seven-point favorites in this game. Give me San Francisco here minus seven and San Francisco straight up. All right, stop my quick thoughts on each game. The Jacksonville Jaguars over the New Orleans Saints. This is a game to where I want to give the Jags defense a tremendous amount of credit. The Jags defense has forced the most turnovers in the league this year. And that is something that should be attested to. Uh, and I feel like a lot of the Jags' impressive defensive players have done really well, especially Josh Allen, not the Bills quarterback, but the other Josh Allen. Uh, who has seven sacks, two forced fumbles, and 11 QB hits this year during this season. He's had an incredible year. Nobody really talks about how dominant he's been in a contract year. The only other player with a stat line like that is probably the defensive player of the year favorite right now in TJ Watt. So I just wanted to make sure that I was aware about how good Josh Allen has been playing for the Jags defense. Travis Etienne had two big scores. He had a very nice game. Uh, he actually scored both those rushing TDs in about 14 seconds after Josh Allen forced a fumble. They got the ball deep in the red zone for Jacksonville. And I really like what the Jags have done through the last few weeks. They played really, you know, consistent, efficient football. Christian Kirk and Calvin Ridley are making more contributions into the offense. Evan Ingram made some nice contributions yesterday against the uh, weak Colts secondary. And the reason why I'm going with the Jags here is – because I believe Trevor Lawrence will play. Trevor Lawrence uh, left the game about three minutes to go, and he had a uh, he had a knee injury, you know. And they did an MRI on the knee. He's day to day. Unfortunately, it's a three day break, so it's not like you know you would have the rest of the week to prepare. He has a very short week, and I think he will play. Because so that's why I'm going with the Jags. If by Thursday night, we find out that, hey, William Law Trevor William Lawrence, and like I said, fun fact, uh, Trevor Lawrence, that is not his first name, that's his middle name. His actual name is William Lawrence. So once again, William Lawrence, William Trevor Lawrence, if he does not play, I will probably take the Saints to win that game, though it could be close because C.J. Beathard is not a bad backup quarterback. But the reason why I'm going with the Jags is because of why I think he's going to play is because the Saints offense has been absolutely putrid this year. The $35 million that Derek Carr got from the Saints, he stole about $32 million of that because that's how bad he's been playing. The Saints have scored 20 or fewer points in five of the six games he started for them this year. And I, I know one of them he couldn't, you know, he he got knocked out and, he, you know, he probably could have won 17. So it should technically be four. We want to be completely honest. But that offense has been abysmal with Alvin Kamara, with Chris Olave, with Rash Rash uh, Rashid Shahid, who had a big 51-yard reception. Um, so when you look at it that way, that's incredibly tough. Also, I wanted to say, I do want to give the Saints defense credit, though. C.J. Stroud, 
um, through his first career interception against the Saints. So, unfortunately, he couldn't get to the 215 mark of Kyler Murray for his, as a rookie, but they did get his first interception, so kudos to the Saints defense for that. And I just want to mention that Blake Groupie, uh, Blake Groupie is a bad kicker. That's twice now in the, the six games that the Saints have played, he has cost them huge points in chip shot fashion. The one against Green Bay back in week three would have won the game, and the second one would have made the game a four-point game. So the second one, it's not, you know, that one's not as critical. He missed the 52-yarder, but again, he's a rookie, and I always will give rookies a pass for 50-plus-yard kicks in the NFL. But you can't miss a 29-yarder, buddy. And they, the Saints need to get a new kicker. So, and the, and the reason why I'm going with the Jags as well is that you don't have to really play a lot of, uh, you don't have to score a lot to beat the Saints at home. This year, in their two home games, they've kicked a grand total of six field goals and scored one offensive touchdown in two home games. So that's about, they've kicked twice as many field goals as they've scored touchdowns in terms of points. And I think with Jacksonville, with that offensive line, Anton Harrison's been phenomenal. Uh, Cam, Cam Robinson, you know, hopefully he'll get healthy. But he's played very well, and I think this Jags team will have a nice, comfortable thing with Trevor Lawrence playing a Saints defense, which will be tough. It's a top five defense in points and yards. But I think the Jags offense can move enough with ETN, with that offensive line, to uh, win the game effectively. So, again, if the Jags don't play, I will probably have a pick update where I'll take New Orleans with the new spread. But if Trevor Lawrence does play, which I expect him to, I think the Jags easily win this game and cover with a one-point uh, differential. So that's why I like Jacksonville here, plus one, and Jacksonville straight up. The next game, the Las Vegas Raiders over the Chicago Bears. This is one to where, look, Josh Jacobs, let me give him some credit. 5,000 yards rushing for a career. Very nicely done. Uh, very good job. And the idea for me is also, like I said before, Josh McDaniel was now 3-0 all, all time against Bill Belichick. This was the most impressive thing that happened for the Raiders was that Devontae Adams, who had been on a tear through the first five weeks of the season, yesterday, he only had two receptions for 29 yards, uh, which was a season low for in terms of receptions and yards. And also, I just want to ask anybody out there, has anyone seen Hunter Renfro for the Raiders? Has anyone seen him? Because this man, through six games, has a grand total of six receptions for 59 yards. He's only played, he only played 7% of the snaps against the Patriots yesterday. And I don't get what's happened to him because I thought he was a decent receiver. And they're just treating him like he's just a nobody. Or he's like, you know, falling the fourth on the depth chart behind even Jacoby Myers. And it's one of those things to where, you know, when you look at this game, I don't really know what they're going to do. But the reason why I'm going with the Raiders over the Bears is because, look, both quarterbacks, unfortunately, were the Raiders and Bears both got hurt. Jimmy Garoppolo had a back injury, which made him go to the hospital, and Brian Hoyer had to play in relief to finish the game. And uh, Justin Fields dislocated his right uh, pinky on his throwing hand, and he could not grip the ball. So in that way, if it comes down to a backup battle of, I think his name is Tyler uh, ba uh, Bajan and uh, Brian Hoyer, I will take Brian Hoyer to win the game. Uh, also, it's just one of those things where yes, yesterday, even when Justin Fields was there, I think he'd only went 6-10 for about 80 yards against a pretty bad Vikings defense. Uh, and the Bears did their job. They held the Vikings even without Justin Jefferson, which I, I, I will put that in perspective. Even without Justin Jefferson, they held the Vikings to a season of 220 yards of offense. But the problem for the Bears is that in five of the six games, the Bears' offense has committed two, at least two turnovers in every game. And if your offense keeps turning the ball over at that rate, you're not going to win a lot of games with Justin Fields as awkward as he is at quarterback, even though he's had a couple of nice flashes the last couple of weeks. And Tyler Bag, you know, for a little bit, he didn't do that much better than Fields, but it's something to wear is if depending on how long Justin Fields needs to, you know, recover or to be able to grip a ball comfortably, I don't know if the Bears are going to win a game with that backup quarterback and the rest of that roster. So Again, if Jimmy Garoppolo plays and, you know, the, the Bears don't have... I think the, Bears, the Raiders easily win. And if they're both out, I'll take Brian Hoyer to beat 
Tyler Magnet. You know, if Justin Fields plays, if they both play, and I, I would, I, like I said before, I'll, I'll, I'm into this pickup bait on Sunday as well. If they both play, I will take the Raiders still. If one of them doesn't play and the other does, I'll take, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the Bears if that happens. If both of them don't play, which I don't expect to happen, uh, just because I feel like if that back injury, if you have to go to the hospital, I expect the Raiders to win in two of those three scenarios. So it's likely I'm going to stick with that Raiders minus three pick. I, once again, just wanted to bring it up there for anybody out there. So, uh, but that's why I like the Raiders over the Bears, just because I feel like the Raiders at least have a competent backup and offensive weapons and a defense that I trust with Max Crosby leading it to be a little bit more effective than the Bears defense that played pretty well, but with a rookie quarterback that nobody, a rookie on drafted quarterback nobody knows, I think the Raiders get the victory with Hoyer if they go. I think even they could win with Aiden O'Connell if they wanted to. But I think Brian Hoyer is going to get the start if Aiden O'Connell or if Jimmy Garoppolo can't go. So that's what I like the Las Vegas Raiders here, minus three, and the Las Vegas Raiders straight up. The next game, the Cleveland Browns over the Indianapolis Colts. This is one to where the Cleveland Browns have right now, they have allowed 1,000. Two total yards through five games this season. That is the third fewest amount of yards since 1970. I think only the 71 Colts and the 1970 Minnesota Vikings are the only two teams that have held teams to total yards fewer than that since the merger. That defense is the best defense in the league. It's not even close. They have great players on all three levels of the defense. And they absolutely obliterated a Niner team that got banged up because of it. It's also one of the largest upsets. I think the Browns, the Browns entered the game being a nine and a half point dog, or even up to a ten and a half point dog, depending on what book you look at. And they won the game outright to uh, to pull off their one of their biggest against the spread upsets in 16 years. So I will say this. Um, I, I have heard about the Sean Watson's rotator cuff injury. It's a deep rotator cuff bruise. I feel bad for in that way. But I think regardless, if P.J. Walker plays or Deshaun Watson plays regardless, I'm going to take the Browns to win this game because I really like that defense. And they're going up against the Colts offense that's with their backup quarterback, Gardner Minshew, where after how well he looked through the first two games against the, tight, against the Ravens and Titans respectively, that third game, he finally looked like Gardner Minshew that we all knew was a career backup because he ended up throwing a career high with three interceptions against his former team. And the Colts' running game was in ineffective and useless. Jonathan Taylor only ran for 19 yards. And he just kept turning the ball over. And the best offensive part of the game was probably Matt Gay, who's probably been outside of Richardson, you know, the best offensive player they have. And it's one of those things, yeah, could... Gardner and Deshaun have an interesting game, maybe. But it's just something to where that defense, with Jim Schwartz probably in my position for coordinator of the year or assistant coach of the year, I really think that the Browns have a good shot to win another gritty, tough type game, especially since they did that against a, a genuine starter in Brock Purdy. Now that I'm getting to play a backup who, in Gardner Minshew, is a worse version of Brock Purdy, is has to be a real positive sign for the Browns to win this game. Also, in a weird way, just a fun fact, I saw this today, and I wanted to share this to everybody. Um, it's really weird how, you know how certain coaches can have certain other coaches' number, like Kyle Shanahan has Mike McCarthy's? Well, Jim Schwartz, the Browns defensive coordinator, has Kyle Shanahan's number because they have played nine career games against each other as head coach coordinator or coordinator coach in either way, and Jim Schwartz now has won eight of those nine meetings uh, against Kyle Shanahan. So he definitely knows how to play Kyle Shanahan's offense very well. He does a good job. At it. So, But, yeah, I'm taking the Browns here because I really like that defense. I trust it enough. And if Deshaun plays, I think it'll be a wrap. If P.J. plays, I think P.J. Walker will play a little bit more efficient football. And I think that Browns defense will cause multiple turnovers once again and grind out another tough and gritty victory for the Browns moving into next week. So that's why I like Cleveland here, minus two. And Cleveland straight up. The next game. The, Bu the Buffalo Bills over the New England Patriots. I am taking the Buffalo Bills here. Because. Man. like It's just because they're playing the worst offense. 
in the league in the Patriots. They, I'm sorry, they have the second worst scoring offense in the league. They just really have not been effective. Mac Jones got sacked in the end zone to win the game. And when you look at this Bills Patriot game, like yeah, look, the Bills, they were incredibly awkward against the Giant team. They were 14 and a half point favorites with. Actually, Sunday night, the Bills became the 15 since the 1970 merger to win a primetime game after being held scoreless through the first three quarters. And the first since the 07 Steelers uh, did it in a 3 nothing game on Monday Night Football. Josh Allen looked awkward. He threw a horrible bad interception to Micah McFadden. Uh, the Bills really couldn't get a lot of good running on the ground. Also, very quickly, shout out to Damian Harris, former New England Patriot player, uh, Buffalo Bill uh, running back now. He had a pretty significant neck injury. Uh, he was pretty much he was not moving for a good amount of time, and obviously for a lot of Bills fans, that brings a lot of trauma back to the Bar Hamlin. What happened back in January? Fortunately, though, for Damian, he was able to give a thumbs up to the crowd, and he's doing progression through the injury, and he should hopefully be okay, and maybe we'll be able to play here later in the year. And it's one of those things. Yeah, the Bills. The Bills also had a streak of 60 straight halves of a point in the first. Uh, and that was the longest streak in franchise history. So if you do that, that's the last 30 games they were able to score at least in the a half through 60 games. Or through at least, through at least the last uh, 30 games, which is almost two years. And I, I, I think the one thing the Patriots can take advantage of, though, is the running defense. Because the Bills have the seventh total worst rushing defense overall. And they give up the most yards per attempt in the league this year but just watching the bills here the last three games that the pats have hosted the bills they have won those games by an average of 17.8 points so you know you could say well if they've won the last three home games against uh new england by an average of 18 points a game why are you taking them uh new england plus nine and a half i just really wasn't impressed with buffalo's offense besides stefan diggs nobody else really makes an impact on that offense they really could not you know, James Hook had a few nice runs, and Josh Allen just keeps literally just running around like a stallion, throwing deep bombs and incredible pass. He had that one touchdown to Quinn Morris that almost looked like an interception, but, you know, Josh Allen, doing Josh Allen things, was able to get that ball tight enough to get a touchdown. But it just, that's the weird thing about the Bills is that they're playing good football, but it's like, it's very much like what Nick Wright said, where it's a roller coaster where he can have such great highs. But those highs never can last very long, and the dip can happen pretty quickly. So, But they're playing a New England offense, and a New England squad that is very inex uh, inexistent and dead offensively. So I think the Bills can kind of grind out another win. I do want to say this, though. The Bills' defense has still done a pretty good job in terms of yards and points, even with the losses of Matt Milano, Tredavious White, and a few other defensive injuries, which are a big form. So I'm taking New England plus 9.5 because I don't trust the Bills offense to be able to move the ball enough or Josh Allen made a couple mistakes to keep the Patriots in the game, but they, there's no way they win just because of the margin of what's happened before. So that's why I like Buffalo here. Uh, that's why I like uh, New England here plus nine and a half and Buffalo straight up. The next game, the Washington Commanders over the New York Giants. This is a game to where the Washington Commanders got outgained 402 to 193. And they still were able to win the game. Because like I said earlier, Desmond Ritter threw three horrible interceptions at the end of the game in a one-score game, which was which was tough. And the the reason why I'm going with the Commanders is at least I know the Commanders can score. You know, I, I do want to shout out uh, uh, Jamin Davis, first career interception, game-winning interception where Desmond Ritter threw a slant right to him at the, at the linebacker spot, which sealed the win for them. But the reason why I'm going with the Commanders is the Giants' offense is awful. The Giants' offense threw 20... They have played 24 quarters of football. That's, so that's six games, ladies and gentlemen. Take the second half of the Cardinals game away. They have scored two total touchdowns in 22 of 24 quarters. They have scored one offensive touchdown and one defensive touchdown. Matt Brieta and Jason Pinnock are the only two guys in the Giants that this year have gotten into the end zone. And we're six weeks in. 
this is the, the worst scoring offense or getting, getting touchdowns. The only one I that I compare to is Pittsburgh that can't get in. And they only have five scores this year. The Giants only have one offensive touchdown the entire year, basically outside of a half. Okay? And that's bad. That is really bad that a majority of the year take 22 of 24 quarters. What is that, 11 of 12? That's 88%. 88% of the season. The Giants, with an offensive coach, with all the money into Saquon, all the money into Daniel Jones, with a Tyrod Buck better than Daniel Jones did last night, they have scored one offensive touchdown in 88% of the season. That is just mind-numbingly bad. And also that clock management at the end of the game was just dreadful by Brian Dayball. And I understand, look, Tyrod admitted at the end of the game he was the one that made the audible to change. But still, I, 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 felt, I felt a little bad for Tyrod because – Brian Dayball chewed him out a good amount. And I, I didn't think they, that he deserved that for what Tyrod had done up to that point because he played better than the $40 million quarterback he had paid uh, earlier this year. So I do want to give Saquon a shout-out, though. You know, a few games out of an injury, but he did have 24 carries for 93 yards and had a couple big runs that helped him move forward. And it was probably the most complete game the Giants have played the entire year. But when I just look at the Giants' offensive line, uh, not having Andrew Thomas banged up. Another one of their linemen went down. And uh, Igazuli, or Igazuli, and I, I know I botched his name, but probably their third best offensive lineman, he went out and got carted off the field. So when you're playing a commander team that has as talented a defensive line as they do with Eric Manning making calls, I think the commanders usually win this game because I don't trust Sam Howell to make a few more plays with the commander's offense compared to Tyrod or Daniel Jones trying to make plays with a future offensive line and the lack of weapons they have at the receiving core for the Giants. So, should be an interesting game, and the Giants showed some light to where if Sam ha if Wink Martindale can pull Sam Howell a bit, maybe they can win the game, but I just trust that Sam Howell and the Commanders will be able to do a little more scheming to counteract Wink Martindale's scheme, and I, I think the Commanders win because of that chess match and the ability of talent on the defensive end the Giants just don't have. So that's why I like Washington here. I'm trying to find your guys here. That's why I like Washington here minus two and Washington straight up. The next game, the Tampa Buccaneers over the Atlanta Falcons. This is one to where I am taking Tampa Bay to beat Atlanta because I just trust Tampa Bay fundamentally as a team more than I do Atlanta. Look, I, I do want to give Atlanta a couple shout outs. But first, fun factor, everybody. Desmond Ritter, for the first time in his football career in college and pro football, finally lost a home game. He had never lost a home game at the University of Cincinnati, and he had never lost a home game uh, in Atlanta for the last couple of years. He finally lost a home game for there. And I do want to shout out Drake London and Calais Campbell. Drake London had a career high in receiving yards with uh, nine catches for 125 yards. And uh, one of the all-time nicest people as a former Raven, I'm incredibly happy for him, uh, Calais Campbell. Getting to play for a, a, a hometown team of his. He got his 100 career sack as a Falcon. And here's the one thing I have to say. They they hired that Saints assistant uh, to come with them. And he has done a very good job. The Falcons, very quietly, they've held, the, they've held opponents to the four fewest passing yards overall in the league this year. And that's of a secondary that, you know, has made some improvements and has some talent on. So that Atlanta defense has done pretty good, pretty doggone well. But the reason why I'm going with Tampa is that, look, Tampa had a tough day. Uh, the Bucks' offense has scored one or fewer TDs in two of the last three games. And the and Baker scored or led an offense that game finished for the fewest amount of points since week eight of the 2020 season, but they played the Raiders where he scored six points there too. And it's just one of those games to where I'm going to trust that the fun fact of Desmond Ritter never losing a home game up to yesterday. Desmond Ritter also has never won a road game in his NFL career. And I'm going to keep riding that streak until he proves that he can do it. And I just trust the Bucks' offense. I trust that, you know, Baker and them have played more consistent. And I have, think they can play at a higher level than what I've seen out of the Falcons, especially with what happened at the end of the game. He had two horrific interceptions that cost the Falcons any opportunity to come back into the game in crucial spots. 
And I just think Baker, he's mad about what happened. And Baker does have some bruising on his right hand. So that's something to watch out for. But I just don't believe that the Atlanta Falcons offense, or let me just put it this way, in the two road games that they played this year, if I remember correctly, they have scored they have scored only one touchdown in two road games this year. Or well, yeah, they have scored one touchdown in two road games this year, which is really bad. And now having to go into Tampa, where Baker and them have looked pretty effective and consistent more often than not, I think the Bucks easily get a comfortable win to uh, get to four and two and back in firm position of the NFC South. So that's all I like Tampa Bay here minus two and a half. Tampa Bay straight up, or Tampa Bay minus two and a half. Yep, Tampa Bay minus two and a half. Tampa Bay straight up. The next game, the Detroit Lions over the Baltimore Ravens. I am taking Detroit here based on the fact that I believe the Lions are a better overall team than the Baltimore Ravens. Detroit now has scored 20 points in 15-plus games. That is a franchise record. Also, for the first time in the Lions' history, and I know back in the 1930s they were the Portsmouth somethings, and I, I'm sorry if I can't remember the team name, but they were from Portsmouth. But the Lions were the first time in their franchise history since they've become the Lions have not given up a 100 yard or have not given up 100 yards rushing as units for the, in the first six games. Detroit has also been very effective over the past 15 games since week nine of the 2022 season, week eight or nine. The Lions are 13 and two in their last 15 games, which is remarkable seeing what you know, the Lions have been over the past three years with Dan Campbell. Everybody thought when they were losing, even though they beat the Cardinals later on a couple years ago, everybody thought Campbell had a lot of pressure on him to perform and do it well. And not only over the past two years has he done that, he's improved the team perception and quality each year, knowing that we now have to genuinely consider, are the Lions the best team in the NFC? I don't agree with that. But I think the Lions can enter that room with the Philadelphia Eagles and the San Francisco 49ers and say, we are one of the best. So. But the reason why I'm going with the Lions is also just for the Ravens. The Ravens kicked six field goals. If you asked if you asked two people who just looked at scores and said, who was responsible for more touchdowns? The Ravens or the Lions? It actually was the Lions. Because the Lions got in the end zone at least twice. The Ravens only got in the end zone once. But they scored more points, and you could say that. But that's the problem. The Lions actually got in the end zone two times yesterday. The Ravens only won. Had to kick six field goals. Justin Tucker had to tie a career high with that. I do want to give the Ravens secondary a lot of credit, though, because we have allowed the fewest passing net chance in the entire year. And we and on the defensive end, the Ravens are tied for the league, leading sacks at 24. So I think that's incredibly encouraging and impressive as well. But when I look at this game between the Lions and the Ravens, I feel that the Lions offensive line should be able to do a very good job against a middling Ravens pass rush at best. The Lions have Sam Laporta, Amon Ross St. Brown, Jamison Williams, Jameer Gibbs, Josh Reynolds. Like They have an offense and talent and an offensive line that's an arguable top five offensive line in the league that can make holes for the Lions to run and give Jared Goff plenty of clean time in the pocket. And I just don't think the Ravens, with the injuries they've had and the consistency they've had at the receiving position and the secondary position, I don't think the Lions can pull this game out, even at home, coming off a big London victory. It should be a great game, and I wouldn't be surprised if the Ravens won, but if you just tell me from what I've seen through the first six weeks, which team has been more consistent, impressive, and dynamic, and the one I would count on, it's the Detroit Lions for me over the Ravens. So. I hope I'm wrong, but that's what I feel like. I think the Detroit Lions go in there, get a comfortable victory in Baltimore, and move on to a 6-1 and record, keeping pace with the Niners and Eagles for the best team in the NFC. So, so that's why I like Detroit here, plus three, and Detroit straight up. The next game, the Los Angeles Rams over the Pittsburgh Steelers. The reason why I'm taking the Rams is because the Rams have actually done fairly well this year in perspective. They really only had... One 
bad game the entire year. And even that was a 10-point loss, but that was against uh, Cincinnati in where Stafford, you know, got sacked a good amount of times and did not look great. And the reason why I'm going with the Rams, though, is because also they found a very effective running back, Mr. Kyron Williams, who is, ne- who is the fourth leading rusher in the league right now at 456 total yards. And Cooper Cup has emerged back from his uh, injury and has turned back into the best, if not one of the best wide receivers in the league. Through two games this year, he has 15 receptions for 266 yards since he's been back. And I trust that the Rams... Being able to stay at home, Pittsburgh having to come out to the West Coast. The last time actually Pittsburgh beat the Los Angeles Rams, you have to go back to 1993, 30 years ago when the last time the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers went into Los Angeles and won the game. Do I think the Steelers can win? Absolutely, because I think the Steelers, they have their formula. The Rams' offensive line is not great, but I think with the talent or the lack of talent in the Pittsburgh secondary, outside of Mika Fitzpatrick, everybody's either just a, a young corner or an experienced corner trying to get one last contractual opportunity before he has to retire. So I genuinely do believe that the uh, Rams grind out this game in Pittsburgh against a a shaky Pittsburgh offensive line and a Kenny Pickett that's had some rest and some confidence, but I don't think enough to overcome Matt Stafford and the Rams. So that's why I like the uh, Los Angeles Rams here, minus three, and the Los Angeles Rams straight up. The next game, the... Seattle Seahawks over the Arizona Cardinals. This is one to where, again, like I said last week, the Arizona Cardinals, frisky team. They're never going to put a great game together, one to four, but they'll put a good enough game together to where, like you can see in the first half, they were up six to three. They were up nine to three, a majority of that game, and they fought with the uh, the Rams fairly well. Though I, I think the problem for uh, the Cardinals has been Josh Dobbs' uh, inability to hold the ball. Because over the last two games, he had four turnovers over the last two games. I think only uh, he had one through the first um, three or four that started. And I just think, look, Arizona, at the end of the day, they're in a spot to where they have a lot of capital. They have a, um, a couple of players on the injured reserve. They might move one of them. I don't think they're going to move Buddha. But they just have too much talent not there that I don't think it's going to matter for them in the long run to be able to win games on a consistent basis. And that's when we go with Seattle. That even though Geno Smith had a horrific end of the game, Pete Carroll didn't do that but much better either. Pete Carroll had a horrible clock management system. He should have taken the field goal uh, to make it a one-point game and get the opportunity. Because at that point, if they get to the 11, only down one, the Seahawks are able to kick a chip shot field goal to win the game. I don't know if uh, Jason Myers would have made it, especially after Jake Moody and Jake Elliott. So it's very interesting how the Jakes really got screwed from the kicking gods there. I don't know if he would have made it, but I look at Geno, and I will tell everybody again, he's still Geno Smith. There was a reason that Geno Smith for 10 years was considered a bum, garbage, hot trash. And he showed you that once again yesterday. Because the Seahawks defense did its job entirely too well. Like I said before, they held the Bengals the 58 total yards of offense in the second half. And what did Geno do when the lights came up bright? He threw a horrible pick in the middle of the field to Nick Scott and then got sacked on 4th and 8 by B.J. Hill to end the game. So, you know, so again, I, I know Seattle, look, they get the rebound, they get to play the Cardinals. But if you want to talk about a team that I think is more of a pretender than a contender, look at that team up in the Northwest because that's the Geno Smith I know. That's the bad Geno that I'm used to seeing in moments like that. Again, I'll get to meet up the Cardinals, because the Cardinals don't really have a quarterback or that much of a team. But I will uh, take Seattle for those reasons, but I, I just think Seattle is a bit overrated in some in some people's eyes. So. Uh, but that's why I like Seattle here minus eight, and Seattle straight up. The next game, the Green Bay Packers over the Denver Broncos. This is easy to where I'm not buying the Denver's defense all of a sudden got better. Denver had the fewest amount of points and the second fewest amount of yard or the second lowest amount of yards gained on them this week. And I think it's one of those things to where 
Russell Wilson had the worst game of his professional career, in my opinion. But am I going to be one of those people that look at Russell Wilson and go, oh, yeah, he has been the main reason he's failed? Because here, or here's the thing. I, I just quick little side here. Russell Wilson has the seventh highest, seventh highest passer rating in the league. Do I think he's been, been the seventh best quarterback this year? Absolutely not. But if you look at ESPN's idiotic quarterback rating stat that they've done since 2006, he's like 20, 27 for 28. I don't think he's a bottom five quarterback either. He's playing about like an average quarterback. I would say he's playing this year like Kirk Cousins. And again, I do think that the Denver Broncos will rebound offensively against a decent Packers defense, which has talent. But I don't know if the De if the Packers offense, where with Jordan Love over the last two games in primetime, he's only completed 59.1% of his passes, one touchdown, five interceptions, and 428 yards. He's been awful. And I think the Denver defense hopefully can confuse Jordan in one of his early starts to make him feel uncomfortable and make plenty of mistakes. And even if Russell Wilson plays well, I just can't trust. With what I've seen out of Jordan Love in the Bears game, the Falcons game, in moments where he can move the offense or has to, he can make a lot of plays, and I just don't think the Denver defense, even with the lack or young, inexperienced receiving core that the Packers have, I think the Packers will be able to just run and catch up and down the field at a good rate that I don't think the Broncos will be able to match due to the discrepancy in defensive uh, ability for the two defenses and defensive capital placed in by the Packers over the past few years to improve that defense to a very young and respectable defense. So... Do I think do I think the Broncos can win? Absolutely, but I'm taking Green Bay. Better defense, trust the quarterback play a bit more, and I just think Sean Payton and them it's in a weird funk. And I just think if they have another tough week of practice, it's not going to look pretty. They're going to fall flat, and I think the Packers take advantage to get back to 500 themselves. To say that we're in the mid room now, just like most other teams. So that's what I like Green Bay here minus one and a half, and Green Bay straight up. The next game, the. Kansas City Chiefs over the Miami, uh, over, I'm sorry, the, the next game, the Kansas City Chiefs over the Los Angeles Chargers. I am taking Kansas City here based on the fact that the Kansas City defense has been the best in the Patrick Mahomes era. Travis Kelsey played phenomenally, nine catches for an on 24 yards. And the Chiefs have the largest margin of victory they've had in the Patrick Mahomes era, which is about nine points per game they are winning by. And I just can't trust the Chargers in this spot. Brandon Staley has more talent. He has probably more talent around him defensively, offensively, especially at the receiver position. Uh, though I do want to shout out very quickly to Chris Jones. Eighth eight straight game of a sack. Incredibly impressive. Hopefully the Chiefs realize at the end of the year, depending on how far you get, how much value you add to the team and your overall value increases tenfold due to your ability. So shout out quickly to Stone Cold Chris Jones there. And look... Tonight, look, the Chargers are getting healthier. Joey Bosa should play. They're getting Austin Eckler back, which is massive. But I am just objectively taking the Chiefs. Because even though you could argue the Chargers have more offensive talent at its key, key spots and an offensive line that can be comparable to Kansas City's, the Chiefs have the better quarterback. Even though Her Justin Urban this year has played pretty well. He's completed about 71% of his passes. from for 1,106 yards, seven touchdowns, only one interception. But it's just Brandon Staley against Andy Reid. And it almost seems like every time, except that one lucky time in back in 2021 where Herbert, uh, they went for it on fourth down a couple times to get conversions that got them the game-winning score. I just think Andy Reid will run circles around Brandon Staley. And it just is, it's another tough, gritty, you know, divisional game. That's why, the, that's why I took the Chargers plus five and a half because I can definitely see the Chargers hanging around and playing a lot more tougher as the game goes on. But at the end of the day... I'm going to take the Chiefs because I trust them enough in this spot with their defense, with Pacheco running the ball, with getting that mini buy that they go on and win an effective game, which they need uh, to, before their next showdown with Denver coming up next Sunday. So that's why I like the uh, Kansas City Chiefs here straight up for the Los Angeles Chargers plus five and a half. And the final two games, the Miami Dolphins over the Philadelphia Eagles. This is one to where I might be putting the horse before the cart a bit with how bad the Philadelphia Eagles looked, in my opinion. Jalen Hurts had a career high in interceptions. 
Uh, it was uh, it was wor the worst turnover differential in the past 32 games of the Eagles. And the Eagles suffered some injuries on the secondary, the offensive line, and a lot of other issues. And I, I know the Eagles, look, usually when they lose, they come right back and start, you know, going into a storm of momentum. But I think this Dolphins team, which is the third best offense of all time in terms of points, it's the number one offense in yards per game and yards per play of the season. It's the third best in terms of, or it is the third best scoring, the third third highest scoring offense all time at 37 points per game. I saw that uh, yesterday. And the Dolphins for themselves, though, are on pace uh, at the number one offense all time in terms of yards per play and yards per game as an offensive unit. And I trust that Buffalo psyche, there's a division aspect there. And Buffalo would just seem to have Miami's number over the past few years. Miami and Philadelphia only play each other once every four years. And most of the time, if I remember, the Dolphins have won, I believe, the last two meetings uh, in this series, one in Philadelphia, one in Miami the last uh, two times, which makes me feel pretty good that I believe Miami with their offense should be able to be effective. Tyreek Hill coming back into the game was significant, but I feel like Tyreek, Mostert, and Waddle should be able to run through the Eagles secondary, and I think Tua makes a strong MVP case where I think he's the overall favorite, but I think he cements himself as the favorite with a very impressive fundamental victory, and I know the Dolphins', all the Dolphins offensive line is bad, but I feel like with Tua, he gets the ball out so quickly, he should be able to make consistently more accurate and timing throws compared to Jalen, which basically the Eagles offense has turned into give Jalen the ball, let him run around a little bit, and uh, throw a deep ball to A.J. Brown, who has about 50% of their target, 50% of their catches, by the way, which is really bad in terms of ratio. But I'm going with the Dolphins here because I just feel like, again, Miami is more well-rounded. They have more momentum. They've scored on a consistent rate, and I just don't think they're not going to fall asleep like Buffalo did, where after they blew out Denver and felt really confident, they they played Carolina. But that game through a half was a lot more competitive, and Carolina scored the, on the first two possessions. So they know, especially that Eagles offense, they can be in a track meet. And I, but I just feel like in that sense, I think Tua makes a few more laps and gets there in about 10 seconds just containing the track metaphor uh, to outplay to outplay Jalen and send the Eagles into a question at five and two of what team are we, who are we going to be, who do we want to be moving forward. So that's why I like Miami here plus two and Miami straight up. And then the last game, the San Francisco 49ers over the Minnesota Vikings. I am taking the San Francisco 49ers because the Niners, when they lose, which over the last few years has not been that often, they usually come back and kick the tar out of their next opponent. And the Niners have a bunch of injuries, and I hope Debo McCaffrey and or I hope Debo McCaffrey all get better soon because they need him. And when you look at Minnesota, they have a lot of offensive and defensive injuries. Justin Jefferson's out the next three games, so he wasn't even going to be a factor this game. And they lost Marcus Davenport, probably one of the better interior defensive linemen. I thought Kirk played okay. But the, yesterday, the hero of the game was uh, Jordan Hicks, who had both the huge fumble recovery and the interception, which basically sealed the victory for the Vikings to get to 2-4 to, and four to uh, have the year at this point. And at the end of the day, as much as I think Brock Purdy, you know, had, took one of his worst games, he still played well enough that Jake Moody was in position for a 41-yard field goal. All Moody has to do is make that kick, and the Niners win, get the 6-0. We have a completely different conversation of how the NFC shapes up. But they're playing Minnesota in a building that hasn't been that, you know, scary for a lot of teams. Tampa Bay went in there and won a game in a close one. The Chargers just went in there and won a game in a close one. The Chiefs won, and now here come the Niners. Like, that's the one thing, the one thing I'll say. I, I would say the Minnesota Vikings will always give whatever team comes to their building, good or bad, a run for their money. But most of the time, just like everything else with Kirk Cousins, and when it, the lights shine on bright and his 2-10 and primetime record pops up, I just don't think that for Minnesota's sake, I don't think the Niners will be able to lose this game just based on the amazing ineptitude of the Vikings. Shout out to you, no, sorry, buddy. But also just the dominance and anger the Niners will be playing with moving forward, especially after that buck-kicking and shocking loss they took on Sunday, or on yesterday. So that's all like San Francisco there, minus seven, and San Francisco straight up. But that is it. So those are all my picks for this week. Like, comment, rate, subscribe. Please check out the NFL YouTube prognosticators page. 
to go see people like Andrew Warren, Half Moon's Picks, Geo Knows, Johnny Brett Geek, Fire and Brim Sports is in my description, Sports Fan Entertainment is in my description, Luca Rosano, shout out to you, buddy, good, good for your career moving forward with the Raptors. But that is it. Edwin Lerner, too, is a great prog as well. Go check out the NFL YouTube prognosticated page. It is in my description. See a lot of other guys and gals make predictions like I do every week. And enjoy their picks and see if you like theirs or not. Agree or not. So, But that is it. So good luck to all players, teams, coaches, fantasy players, and fellow prognosticators. And until next week, this is Matthew Elmanic signing off. Until next time, everyone. So long.